Good to see you again. You too. It's been a whole hour, I think, I since we last saw one another. <laughs> so I was enjoying a wonderful dinner last night in a downtown restaurant when I was taken away with a frantic phone call from somebody whose identity will remain anonymous, telling me that talks had broken down, that there was not going to be a meeting today between you and Ms. Clark, and that there was uh, no agreement to be found on the fifth condition. And at that point, I thought, boy, my fireside chat with Allison's going to be wonderful tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll get to that in a minute. But I think it's only appropriate, before we start talking about energy, that we talk for a few minutes about what happened in your province this, this past summer, um, the greatest natural disaster in Canadian history. I was there in September uh, to look at what was going on in High River. We talked then, and you said, you told me that you thought that the floods uh, permanently altered the character of Alberta. So I'd like you to expand on those comments and then perhaps give us a real brief update on where restoration and mitigation efforts stand. Well, th thank you for as asking the question uh, because we really are living with it every day right now. And I, I thought a little bit about that. And it, in some ways for me even, it's just sort of uh, moments of flashback to terrible crisis. You know, part of my work before I moved back to Alberta was to work in places that were immediate post-conflict situations. And I think that even for me as someone who was familiar with those sorts of circumstances, it's an incredibly disturbing thing to see it happening in your hometown, your home province, and in your community. And my constituency was, was very directly impacted. A lot of friends and family were, were impacted directly. I think for a lot of people in Alberta, there's still this sort of disbelief that it happened. And even though we see reminders of it every day and businesses that still aren't open and some people that aren't yet back in their homes, quite a few actually, it's as if because we have this sense of resiliency that we know that we can get over it, which is fine, but we are also taking the time to appreciate the fact that the world really did change. The communities were pulled apart that family life was disrupted, that people are having um, emotional reactions to this, uh, and it's changed the way that we as a government think about how we support communities. One of the things that we've really noticed is an increase in the number of people that are reaching out for support with respect to emotional issues and mental health issues. Uh, and then, of course, there's the infrastructure piece, which will take years to rebuild. So there's this sort of lack of... Um, ability to understand how directly the physical foundations of our community were hurt and destroyed. And because of that, what you see is people that think, oh, well, this was a moment in time, and now we're past it. We've moved on, and we will simply have life continue as it did. And the odd part is that for a large part of our province, they weren't impacted by this. The people that were impacted were severely impacted, but there are parts of Calgary where there was absolutely no sign of any of this happening. And so there's always that balancing in terms of how we make sure that families and communities are getting the support that they need. You know, it's a really hard question for me to talk about, and I tend to revert to anecdotes when I do it, and I think that's because it had, had an impact on me as well, but not as directly as some people. We, you know, we, I can give you the statistics. We have 90% of the roads that were impacted by floods rebuilt. Uh, we had 80 schools that were impacted, 78 of them opened on the first day of school, and there are 960 students that aren't back in a permanent school, but they're in good, solid structures. Uh, we have 254 people that are making decisions about whether or not they're going to continue to live in their houses because their houses are on a floodway. We have 9,000 people who will apply probably to our disaster recovery program that will allow them to rebuild their homes. But every one of those people is a family and a story and a different circumstance. And the work that we're trying to do is to give them the information and the resources that they need to make those decisions. Uh, you look at a town like High River, and it will come back. As I said to you at lunch, in our municipal elections, the highest voter turnout of any community in Alberta was High River. And, and those are people that aren't actually living in High River yet, so they actually came back to High River <laughs> to vote for their, their mayor. And they have a fantastic mayor who's lived in the community for generations. So there's lots of resiliency and there's lots of opportunity. It's going to be a tremendous uh, financial commitment, probably six to eight billion dollars. 
uh, and we will get through it, but it will be different. It will be different. And the other thing I will say as the Premier of the province is the generosity of people from across the country and even people from other parts of the province that weren't impacted to just understand how deeply this hit people. Well, thank you very much. I think it needs to be said that I, I think that you and Mayor Nenshi displayed incredible leadership under some incredibly trying conditions, and you deserve a lot of credit for that. Thank you. Okay, now, now let's get to the juicy stuff, okay? <laughs> Last night it didn't look like you were uh, in, you couldn't reach agreement on condition five on economic benefits. All of a sudden this morning we learned that you have. What changed in the last 12 hours? You know, our, our perspective has always been that those five conditions are something that we think are important because they're the same values that we live by in terms of how we develop our resources. Uh, you'll know that early on, uh, when Premier Clark talked about that fifth condition, we made it very clear that we couldn't endorse that if it had anything to do with royalties or, or taxation, uh, anything that would impact Alberta's ability to earn revenue from those resources. Um, and so we wanted to clarify that, and we did clarify that very early on. But when we talk about economic benefit, one of the areas where we spent a fair amount of time having discussions yesterday amongst officials is what could that look like? And we want it to be very clear that just as is any other energy project or infrastructure project that needed to move forward, that the economic benefit can't be provided or guaranteed by, for example, the government of Alberta. You know, you asked me the question about uh, pipelines in Alberta that are taking BC product to market. That's an economic transaction. At some point in time when those pipelines were built, uh, industry sat down with the government of Alberta, took a look at what would make economic sense and whether or not the projects could move forward. And so we wanted to very clearly agree, which we do, between the two governments, that if there is a discussion that the government of British Columbia would like to have with industry that might be involved in developing uh, commercial projects, that they are commercial projects. And that that's something that the government of British Columbia is entirely entitled to do and should do, because that's what every jurisdiction should do. But that we didn't see a role for ourselves in that. And we wanted, it really wasn't sort of that it wasn't going to happen, but we wanted to make sure that we were clear on that moving forward. Okay, so th the way this is being interpreted is, okay, they, they, BC can't get its hands on your royalties, fair enough. So they're going to find a, d a different ways to skin the cat here because they don't feel that they're getting enough in terms of economic benefits to compensate for the environmental risks that they're taking. They feel that BC feels that it should get more than Saskatchewan is going to derive from, from this project. So what they're going to end up doing is one of the options would be toll, put a toll on that oil that comes across BC, BC land. So when Mr. Anderson's pipeline gets built, if it does, he's going he's gonna to have to pay a bit more to the BC government to compensate. And I guess that gets back to the point. In Alberta, people are offended by this notion because BC natural gas goes from BC across Alberta land to, to market, and it isn't told. So are you going to take some political heat back home for endorsing something that some, uh, many people in your province don't agree with? Well, I was standing next to Premier Clark today, and she gave a few examples of what economic benefit could look like. And until uh, the government of British Columbia and the people of British Columbia have worked with industry to determine what that means, I'm not going to speculate on what it means. That is certainly one example, um, but it may or may not be the one that we end up seeing. I, I just don't know. Okay, so uh, let me ask you this. In your opinion, now that you have agreement on the five conditions, how much closer, in your view, does this get Alberta to seeing uh, heavy oil move across British Columbia in pipelines? Well, I, I think it's really important. I mean, I, I was so excited that everyone in this room was so excited when you heard that we agreed to the five conditions. If we stop talking about them in the abstract, about five conditions, there are five things that matter to BC and they matter to Alberta. So significant consultation and partnership with First Nations. Management of the risk of marine issues, of terrestrial issues, regulatory approval, and economic benefit for British Columbia. We're moving ahead on all five of those points. 
And there's no doubt in my mind, as I said earlier, that you know, we don't snap our fingers and just see a project develop overnight. All of these projects continue to evolve. They're the values that allow us to move this forward. And the fact that we can partner together on that and share those values, I think gives us tremendous optimism for success on this sort of a project. Okay. Uh, speaking of uh, one of the five conditions that isn't about money uh, around oil spill response, in the last couple of months, uh, the BC government commissioned a study uh, that showed Canada's oil spill response recovery capacity is woefully inadequate. The, some of the models that the company, research company ran showed best case scenario, 50%, only 50% of the oil would be recovered in a, in a spill. And in some cases, if a spill happened along the north coast during particularly bad weather, the chances of recovering any of that oil would be almost zero. So how do you respond to that? I mean, does that effectively kill Northern Gateway, which hopes to get its oil out through the north coast? Well, at, at the end of the day, uh, the people of British Columbia will have to decide how they move forward with that project. Um, it's, it's not for me to, to uh, defend a record or comment directly, but what I will say, what I will say generally on this issue is that every single day that I've worked with industry since I became Premier, industry is striving to do better. That doesn't mean that there aren't sometimes incidents. The question is, how does industry respond? How do pipeline companies respond? What does pipeline safety look like? And I'll tell you, pipeline safety in 2013 looks a heck of a lot different than pipeline safety in 2000 or 1990 or 1980 or 1950. So in terms of construction and design and really taking a look at how pipeline and industry can respond, I think it's important to also look at it in terms of the context of technology today. There's no doubt that the federal government has already started to be meaningful partners with the province of British Columbia in what we do with respect to marine response and terrestrial response. These are all important issues. There will not be a point in time where we sort of, you know, uh, put our hands together and say, we're done. We should never be done. We should always be striving to do better. And we always have to ensure that we're dealing with those issues. We've commissioned a, a report as well with respect to pipeline safety to make sure that we're working with industry to identify gaps and to make sure that every single time that we have the opportunity to do something better, we do. And, and I think that's what you do. You have a mature conversation about it. But you can't shut down the world. You can't do it. Uh, I believe next week you head back to Washington. I do. And how many times have you been to Washington now? This will be my fifth visit to Washington. Fifth visit Never to more Washington. than two days. <laughs> this is about 18 hours. So. Well, I think obviously your prime mission in Washington is trying to educate people there about uh, the oil sands, some of the environmental measures that you've introduced. But at the same time, you are competing with some very powerful voices in the United States, including your cousin Robert Redford, who... Uh, <laughs> who made a little video a couple months ago. And then uh, before that, Neil Young gave a famous uh, powerful speech, impassioned speech in Washington, DC. And there's been others, Al Gore, uh, against you guys. I, I know that some of the, this has been dubbed celebrity ecotourism. But at the same time, I don't think you can discount the, the powerful nature of this message. How do you combat that? Or can you possibly combat that? Well, I start with facts, <laughs> and, and I don't say that facetiously, and I also ask people to be honest with themselves about what they're trying to achieve and how they're getting there. I mean, TransCanada Pipeline has a number of people that have been advocates for Keystone for many, many years who've even gone to Sundance to talk to people at Sundance about pipeline safety and pipeline security. Well, my goodness, they can hardly get into the airport for private jets. So, Let's be honest about what we're talking about, is who's making the choices and who are you making the choices for? The other thing is, and I, I firmly believe this, and I commented on it a little bit in my speech here, the world will demand energy, and they will demand the sorts of energy that we produce. 
Uh, people will demand that in the United States. They will always look to the lowest cost form of energy because that's what people do. They tend to look to their pocketbooks. And quite frankly, our sense right now in the United States is that much as we're seeing in BC and Alberta, the economic imperative is for growth. It's for business growth. And we're hearing a lot of voices in industry talking about the fact that this pipeline matters, not for Alberta or British Columbia, but for producers in the United States that are extracting resources right now that they need to get to the Gulf Coast. Uh, so there's lots of reasons why this could go ahead, and there will be those voices who aren't being as transparent as they should be about their objections, but that's fine, we expect that, and we carry on. At the end of the day, I think that decisions around energy infrastructure come down to economics, and you want to see people are making the decisions and balancing the fact that economic growth and growing the economy is going to matter. We're certainly hearing a lot of that. And if you actually look at things like the State Department's environmental impact assessments, we see that the sorts of myths that some people are putting out there simply aren't true. And I want to tell you one story. About a week after I became the premier of the province, so you can imagine that now we have an awful lot of people that work in the office who all have assigned jobs. And the first week or so, I couldn't quite figure out what everyone did. And I wasn't sleeping very much. And I was up at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I had the television on, and the ticker tape news was uh, running along the bottom of the screen. And the ticker tape said, Redford opposes pipeline. And I thought, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's not a very good first week. But it was the other guy. Um, I think at this point I'm going to ask, uh, w w we wanted to uh, give the audience a chance to ask a few questions. So anybody who has a question for the Premier, please hold up your white cards with your question on it and someone will come along and collect them and then they'll be vetted to make sure they're not too difficult. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, I'll uh, continue here uh, until we get some of these questions. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Alberta puts a price on carbon. I believe it's $15 a ton currently. There has been some discussion that you are intending to raise the price on carbon. But then that message seemed to be a little bit confused because you expressed the view that you were concerned that if you put a price on carbon ahead of the United States doing anything on this front, that it's going to put Alberta businesses at a competitive disadvantage. So where do we stand on this issue? Well, our, our position hasn't changed. We have a price on carbon. Uh, we use the money that's, uh, that's raised as a result of that uh, for a technology fund that invests in research and technology to provide more sustainable development. And when I go to Washington, I talk about the fact that we've made investments in things like carbon capture and storage that we've made, taken a lot of steps that matter in terms of dealing with, with the emissions. That's the first thing. What we've always said is that while people around the world are talking about adding a price to carbon in jurisdictions that don't have it, which, are, which is most of North America, uh, or, or actually looking to um, change what that price is, that it's got to be part of a continental conversation because we've taken steps that other jurisdictions in North America haven't. Our industry has been leading the way in terms of sustainable development and we're not going to step in and put in place a new set of regulations or increase prices until we know that other jurisdictions are prepared to not just judge us without taking steps, but actually take the steps themselves. Uh, the federal government needs to be part of this conversation, and we see in the throne speech that the federal government is now talking about this a little bit. It is important that we talk about it. It's important that we do something about it, but our point is we have already done something about it, and it would be a bit ridiculous for us to then say, well, we're going to do more before anyone else has. So it is something that is important for us to do work on, because if we were to decide to take that step, we would want to know how it impacted industry. Industry would want to know how it would work. So we're always involved in policy discussions around those sorts of issues. But in terms of a plan deliberately right now to increase, we're not going to do that because we're not going to put ourselves in an uncompetitive position. Okay, uh, we have a question here. Um, can the required labor be found in Canada to support the opportunities uh, 
that are now uh, available? Yeah. It's a tremendous challenge. And uh, I, I'll tell you, I was down in uh, Chicago about seven or eight months ago, and I was going in to meet with some people from the AFL-CIO, and as I went in, the Canadian Consul General said to me, well, we've got some really good news on that front because the cap's just been raised to 3,000 for temporary foreign workers. And I said, oh, for Alberta? And she said, no, for all of Canada. <laughs> so Premier Clark also talks about the fact that as our energy industries continue to grow, that we're looking still to find tens of thousands of people. And we've made some pretty good progress with the federal government in terms of immigration programs being more responsive with respect to skilled workers. But our view, my view and Premier Clark's and from our last conversation at Council of the Federation, is that we actually need to urge the federal government to do more work with respect to the provincial nominee program, the temporary foreign workers program, so that we can bring in more skilled labor. Because quite frankly, our experience in Alberta, and I don't know if this is your experience here, but if it's not, you'll probably find it soon, is that we probably have attracted, mo and Heather would have an opinion on this too, we have probably attracted most of the people who were living in Canada who were going to choose to permanently move to Alberta or, well, I'm, I'll talk about Alberta because I know that. We have a lot of people that continue to travel back and forth and commute, and that's okay as well. But we're going to have to make sure that we're continuing to build a community where we can attract a population of skilled workers that can come. I think it's one of our greatest challenges as we move forward. And we're going to have to really think aggressively about what our immigration programs are to ensure that we're attracting skilled workers. And it's everything. It's the way that we attract international students to come to our universities so that they stay in Canada. It's the way that we bring people in on short-term programs. All of that is going to have to be part of what we do. And we, we have a lot of work to do. And it's got to be work that we do in partnership with the federal government. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'd like to ask you about rail as an option. There's, there's a lot of uh, discussion uh, uh, right now about, about rail and its future in terms of moving oil. Um, I'd, like you, I'd like to know what you think about the role it can play. Will it only always be a, just a marginal player? And, and secondly, I'd like to get your comments on the G7G proposal, uh, the, the rail line to Alaska, which is very intriguing in terms of the capacity it has. So maybe you could talk about that. Well, if we don't get pipeline built, rail will keep growing. And some people think that's not a bad thing, but let's think about where ra rail exists in Canada. Rail exists in Canada, crossing every major waterway and running through every major urban centre. And as pipeline has not been built, we have seen an incredible increase in shipping of product by rail. And unfortunately, we see some pretty terrible accidents sometimes. Again, not a lot of the time, but when they do happen, they're of course of concern to people and they impact communities. So from our perspective, if we don't get some of this pipeline built, you are gonna see that increase in rail. Rail has always been there and it's a very safe way to produce or to, to transport quite a bit of, of, uh, of product. But we think we need both, and I think it would be wrong to think that it's one or the other. Um, yes? G7G, quickly. G that, that's a very intriguing proposal, you're right, and it's something that we've talked to uh, congressional leaders and governors in the United States about as well, because they're very interested in that. I think that it's an option that if it starts to make economic sense, industry will support. But at the end of the day, that's going to have to be the determining factor. Okay. Well, Premier, uh, thank you very much for your time. It's always a delight. Well, I'm sure we could spend another hour talking about this. But it's always great to talk to you because you know your issues, you take it seriously, and I think you're probably one of the most impressive leaders in the country. So thank you very much for dropping by. Thank you very much.